Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to another week of Ask a STEM Sistar with me, Ami Bakare. Um, and we have a wonderful guest with us this week, Tamala Curtis. Yay. Um, Tamala is a global medical digital consultant. And so from the title of this video, you can kind of see we want to know what is that? Um, so thank you so much for joining us this week, Tamala. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, your role as a global medical digital consultant. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Amy. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak uh, on SimStars. Um, so to answer your question, what is a global medical digital consultant? Um, that is a mouthful, um, but basically you can think about it by breaking that title down. So global means that I work across multiple different countries. Um, so I have uh, projects that are going on in the US, in Japan, in Europe, um, in Canada. And when you think about what some of those uh, capabilities are, think in terms of the environment that we're in right now. Everyone has pivoted to some sort of digital um, capability or some type of virtual environment. When I work for a pharmaceutical company and our job is to communicate out medical information to doctors, nurses, any of our healthcare provider customers. And we disseminate that information in those digital and virtual channels. So that's the way that I look at that career by breaking it down into pieces and parts. It's really the information that is uh, medical in nature, the content around a lot of our products and services how do we actually deliver that or post that or host that information so that it can be visible by healthcare providers? Oh, wow. That was an awesome um, explanation. And you're so right. In today's world, um, pretty much everything needs to be like virtual or digital or anything like that now, just because in our new post-COVID world, <laughs> um, it pays to be you know, digital. Um, <laughs> so that was awesome. I am curious, what is the educational background that you have to have to get a role like that? So what was your undergraduate um, degree in and kind of how did you decide um, to pick whatever major you decided on? <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of laughing um, at the same time that you're asking that question because my background is completely diverse and void of a straight path to get to this role. We love that here. <laughs> <laughs> we love that here. <laughs> so I often use the term, you know, I didn't follow the herd and not that there's anything wrong with that. If you can take a straight line to get to the end result of where you want to go, that is amazing. Um, but I took a route that probably looked like a seesaw, a roller coaster, a circle <laughs> to get here. Um, but basically working for pharma, you can have any degree um, that the beauty of that is that it allows you to be able to come in um, at any level. Um, so if you have a background in the healthcare field, that's great. It gives you additional leverage because you have the clinical acumen that backs up your ability to be able to communicate science and complex information. But it's not a requirement. Um, pharma has individuals that have degrees in anything. Um, it could be finance. Um, it could be, you know, business majors. Um, you could really have a degree in anything. If you have the learning agility and you're passionate mm -hmm. about the patient, you're passionate about products and services that you can get out to customers, 
that are going to transform someone's life. It's really the enthusiasm and that uh, attachment to purpose that will align you with any role. Um, specifically for me, um, to answer your question, I do have a medical background. So I was trained as a registered dietitian. Um, there are different levels to that uh, degree. Um, I chose to go and work in the hospital setting and uh, I worked in the pharmacy. Um, I wrote uh, TPN and tube feedings, which is um, nutrition support uh, for patients that are in the ICU. Um, so again, an analogy to kind of what's going on today, you see a lot of uh, news um, around COVID-19 and the patients that you're seeing um, in the hospitals, they are in a medical intensive care unit, um, meaning that there's some critical situation that's happening. Um, typically in that scenario, patients can't eat uh, by mouth like you and me, um, that mm -hmm. we can go and have breakfast, lunch and dinner. So, but they still require some nutrition support to keep them alive and healthy and get nutrients. And so it's just basically feeding them through an IV um, that will uh, disseminate all of the electrolytes and nutrients that they need um, until they're able to be well and come off of the ventilator. Okay, wow. That's, yeah. That seems like it's a very, very important part <laughs> of a hospital stay. And that's honestly something that I never even thought of as being um, like a role for somebody to play like in a hospital setting. But yeah, you're totally right that that would be very important for somebody who maybe is having, you know, difficulty eating um, like, a, like normal. Um, they might need a, additional assistance. And so that's a very important <laughs> role that I think is very almost like an unsung hero. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, before today, you know, or before speaking with you, like that's not something that I even knew yeah. um, was a role. And so that's awesome that you, you know, were interested in doing something like that. And then you were able to pursue that. And so um, in undergrad, you, so your major would have been, it was like, Dietary. Yep, dietary. Um, the but the science behind it. So got it. Okay, dietary. Think science. about it. And, uh, I I equate it to almost like a pharmacy. So everyone has okay. interacted with a pharmacist. Pharmacists can work in any environment. You can have retail pharmacists, which you know those are the people you interact with behind the counter at CVS and Walgreens. But a pharmacist can also work in the hospital. Um, a pharmacist okay, yeah. can also work in pharmaceutical uh, at a pharmaceutical company. Um, that's the same as a dietitian. There's different levels. Um, you can think even with nurses. Nurses can be, you know, they can work as a traveling nurse. Um, they can work in, uh, you know, the operating room. Um, they can do multiple different, uh, you know, take many different paths um, in terms of their career trajectory. Um, and this is one path. So when you think about a registered dietitian, what probably immediately comes to mind is coaching um, one on one yes. Uh, yes. that someone is actually helping you write out a plan to help you meet your weight goals um, <laughs> or to you know generate good health. And that is one one area. Um, or aspect of um, a registered dietitian that you can take. Um, but I pivoted and wanted to work in the hospital setting because I was intrigued um, with science and math. Um, those were my favorite subjects um, when I <laughs> was in uh, really middle school to high school. Okay. Um, there was just something about being able to dig in and figure it out and problem solve. Um, that just resonated with me. Um, and it, it's it's funny because when I went to college, um, I actually ended up getting a minor in chemistry by default because mm -hmm. I was taking chemistry classes as my electives. So I ended up taking wow. enough courses <laughs> to graduate with a minor. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So I say that um, just because it, it, to reemphasize, you know, my passion um, for science and math. Um, and that's what kind of led me on this path to exploring other careers um, that I could use that diverse background and that skill set and my passion. Um, so I've worked in medical device um, where I've sold, um, uh, you know, devices and uh, now I'm working in pharmaceuticals. So it's all been a path that has linked um, one to the other. Um, and I stay true to, you know, what I'm passionate about and where I feel like I have an immediate interest. So <laughs> that is awesome and also very unique. Um, and I say that as a person who has not taken a science class since I was in, maybe I was like a junior and I took my <laughs> last science class and I was like, whoo, wonderful. Never take yeah, science. I was the nerd. I was the nerd. <laughs> but I think that's awesome that you, you know, found out that you had that interest in like middle school or like when you're kind of like younger, because what we kind of see um, now is, you know, girls might be interested in like STEM fields um, earlier on, they might be intrigued, but then, you know, there's a little bit of like a, like a leaky bucket situation going on, especially with, you know, young black girls is that you might, yes. you know, trail off as you kind of get older. And so that was really encouraging um, to hear that you kind of stayed interested in that, you know, from that age, you know, all the way through. And so I'm curious to know, like, what do you think made you maintain that interest in, you know, pursuing a STEM career? Yeah, I honestly, I 100% agree with you. I think something happens in that middle school, maybe high school um, area where it could be multiple different things that are going on, you know, um, in a person's life that they veer off from that. For me, I think the secret sauce was having that support um, from my teachers um, primarily, mm -hmm. because often we may, as you mentioned, see that we have an interest or we may you know, think that it's fun, but we may be getting different messages from people around us, even our friends um, that may steer us in another direction. Um, but for me, I credit my teachers um, and family members with seeing that there was something like a light bulb that was going off with me. And they took that initiative to keep me on course. Um, I can remember one teacher, her name is Mrs. Sledge, um, and um, she's not here today, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but I feel like I owe my life to her um, because she was one of the very first people that I credit when people use the word, um, you know, a mentor or a sponsor, because I felt like she was that catalyst for me to say, Anytime I you know, felt like I was veering off course or I wanted to go do something different, she reminded me that this was something that I was good at and I had mm -hmm. an obligation to see that through. It was a gift that I was given and I needed to um, be able to extend that to the fullest extent of what I do. And I've continued to carry that with me um, and stay motivated and stay passionate about it. Um, through her initial encouragement. So I, I would say having support mechanisms around you and having the courage within yourself too to be able to stay on course. So that would be my advice that I would give anyone. Well, that is, you know, definitely, that was actually one of the questions that I was going to ask <laughs> you was like, what advice would you give a freshman in high school or something? But honestly, I think your answer, along with some of the other women that we've also had on previous episodes, that's a common theme is that for everybody um, that has, you know, been on this path, you're in a STEM career, um, everybody says that they had a, a sponsor or a mentor, everybody has one person that they kind of latched on to, and that person kind of guided them 
on this path, you know, and kind of encouraged their enthusiasm in STEM. And so I think what's interesting about you saying that is that that's kind of the basis of our YouTube channel is that my sister and I, we really just want to encourage, like continue to encourage, um, especially, you know, African-American girls to continue on your journey. Like if you are interested in a STEM, yes. um, you know, major or, you know, having a career in STEM, continue on your path. Like there's people out there who would support you. And, you know, we strive here at STEM to start <laughs> to be those people who can support you. And I'm sure that, you know, Tamala, as well as some of the other people that we've interviewed previously would, you know, also serve to be um, a point of reference as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I would encourage anyone. Um, for me, it is just that. I consider it my obligation to give back and to, and so I'm excited um, about what you're doing, you and your sister, in starting this YouTube channel, because I feel like it's a conduit to be able to give that information. Um, when you're growing up, sometimes, you know, you may be in a situation um, like I was, you don't know what the possibilities are. Yes. or what the potential is for a career assignment. I can honestly tell you that when I was in school, a global medical digital consultant, like that was nowhere on my radar. I was yeah. not thinking, yeah, that's the title that I want. <laughs> that didn't show up on any career map um, that I did. But that's the beauty of it is STEM careers allow you the ability to have just a blank slate. Um, I, I equate it to just a, a, a white space or a, or a blank sheet of paper where you can chart your own course because that foundational knowledge will be relevant to almost any career aspect that you can think of across the yeah. board. And it will lead you to places that you probably never would have thought of. Um, if you had asked me when I was a little girl, would I ever go to Japan and actually lead a team in a country that is literally halfway around the world? I would have been like, no way. Are you crazy? Like, no, <laughs> um, but it happened. Um, so I would say, you know, continue to uh, promote this channel, continue to reach out, continue to um, ask for support. Um, and network with other individuals, find mm -hmm. out as much as you can and just be a, a bucket for learning. Um, there's so much that you can do. Um, what's known now and things that we don't even know in a post COVID environment that may evolve um, out of this that could be careers that, you know, there are no titles for those today, but you could create that. Yes, so that is the perfect segue into my next question, which is going to be, you mentioned that, you know, having a STEM career is almost like a blank slate. It kind of gives you all these opportunities. And so, you know, we have heard where you kind of are today in your career, but, you know, do you have a, I'm sure everybody has a dream role, but what is your dream role? Um, and what role would you love to like retire from? You know, I, I don't, I, because my path has always been so diverse, um, I, I'm the kind of person that's open to anything. Um, I think that when you stay open, it allows you to expand your creative juices and you're not afraid to say no. Um, because again, it'll, mm -hmm. it just can open avenues and doors that you wouldn't expect. Um, so I would just describe my, you know, goal, um, of, of interest, um, in terms of my career, um, is being able to continue to lead, um, to coach, um, and use my diverse background in whatever way, um, that makes my team successful and makes my organization that I'm working with successful. So anytime I'm doing that, I feel like I'm doing my best work. Um, and the title, it could be whatever it is. Um, <laughs> I, I don't get too hung up on that. It's more 
the day-to-day work um, and the connection to my passion. I love that note on the connection to your passion because um, last week, like we did, or we did some, you know, quotes and like my quote from last week was about, you know, every job that you're going to (laughs) find, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, a job is a job. So, I mean, you know, you'll eventually it kind of gets a little boring a little bit, (laughs) but you know, what helps is when you've chosen a career or chosen a path that is at least tied to something that you're passionate about, you'll still be finding something exciting about that role, um, you know, as time goes on, just because I cannot stress again, folks, jobs are jobs. (laughs) Yes, I completely agree with you. Um, There was some advice that I'd gotten from a peer um, in relationship to exactly what you just said. When you're on your quest to looking for a career, um, whether it's your first career or the next career or your hundredth career, um, you always wanna leave a little bit of room to stretch yourself. But the other 80%, it, it's almost like that 80-20 rule. So the 80% is I have some interest in this, um, a passion for it. I have the fundamentals. I've got the, you know, just the baseline foundational knowledge to execute and be successful in this role. But the 20% is the part that's actually going to stretch you. So Mm -hmm. what is new about this role? What can I learn? How can I improve and get better? Leave that little bit of 20% for that role. And the reason for that links back to what you just said, because there's no perfect job. Let me just tell you, there there isn't, it doesn't exist. There's going to be days where you're going to be, you know, a hundred percent and you're going to get all the flowers and all everything. And then there's going to be days where you're just like roughing it, trying to make it through. And it's going to be that 80% that's going to be your anchor um, that will you know, kind of pull you in and keep you connected to that job. So practice that 80-20 rule at any point in your career. Leave just a little room for stretch, but make sure that you have some space reserved um, that's connected to you and your purpose that will get you through those hard times on the job. Yes, that is that is awesome advice. And that's a great way to um look at it. And as we kind of think of just, you know, jobs are jobs and, you know, there's no perfect job, just like there's no perfect job. I feel like, you know, as, you know, Black women in, um, you know, the field that we're in, um, there's obviously no perfect scenario. (laughs) Um, So I'm always curious, like, what are the, are, what are the unique challenges um, for Black women in your field? Um, I don't know if they're unique or not, because I often hear some of the same challenges from other Black women that, you know, yeah, that sounds familiar. That's something that I also had to sort of grapple with. Um, One of the things is being recognized um, as an expert. Um, So people understanding that, you know, I do have receipts. And yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I I can contribute and add to um, the discussion or the project or the information. So um, I'm sitting at the table because I do have the expertise and the credentials to be there. Um, so that's yes. a common. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm also, um, as a Black female, I think, you know, we are often, when you think about the hierarchy, um, you know, of majority and minority, we're often the last ones, you know, on the table. Um, I think about, you know, when you get picked for the teams and, and everybody's picking, you're, you're like the last one that gets picked, right? Um but it's because of biases um, that are associated with Black women. 
Um, but we are strong. We persevere. Uh, we have talent that's above and beyond. And, you know, I mentioned courage before. You have to have the courage to be able to stand up, to speak up, um, and to make yourself be heard and be seen mm -hmm. um, and not be afraid of that because you deserve to be there. You deserve to be at all the tables. Yeah. Um, and you have to be the one that's championing for yourself and knowing that you have the backing of other Black women because those challenges, like I mentioned before, we've all gone through them to some extent, um, mm -hmm. but there's a common thread. And so we're all backing you, we're all championing you, and we want to see the best. I certainly want to see the best um, for any Black female that's coming up behind me. And I'll do my best to continue to, to forge a path. I love that. Everything that you just said, because I literally had to have a conversation exactly like that today, earlier today. <laughs> um, you know, pretty much like, here are my receipts. <laughs> Here they are. Here's a list of them. So, <laughs> and honestly, it has taken me, you know, up till this point in my career to be comfortable yes. having those kinds of conversations. So, I mean, it's definitely something that takes, I mean, depending on your personality, maybe, but, yeah. you know, for me, it is something that I have been actively working on um, just because naturally I'm not the kind of person that, you know, is going to. I don't want to say toot my own horn, but you know, it's a little bit difficult yes. for me just to be like, no, look, here's all the things that I did. Here's all the things that I did. Look, you've seen yeah. them, right? You were there. Yeah. So, I mean, it is not by any um, stretch easy, I think, to do those things. But yes, I think once you can, you know, once that becomes second nature and you're good at doing it, I think that that helps or that will improve the, um, the experience um, of just being a black woman in the yeah. workplace. No, and I'm so proud of you because um, I'm naturally an introvert. Um, I'm originally from the South. So, um, you know, that connotation around, you know, Southern Belle, you're supposed to be nice and quiet, keep yourself really small, don't be too loud, all of those things I've heard. And those were things that I had to overcome um, as I grew up and in my career. Um, and there are times, so I can relate to what you're saying because it becomes a challenge um, to voice your concerns. Um, so it's mm -hmm. something that I encourage people to practice that though. Um, don't be afraid. Even if you take baby steps, you know, you may not just come out all together <laughs> in one, pool yes. you know, it may be one interaction in the course of the week. But the idea is that you're practicing, you know, that uh, change in behavior um, every day to where it becomes second nature for you. So, yeah, I definitely agree with you because um, I think as women, we're taught to, you know, make sure that you're nice and polite and keep things quiet. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's definitely a time for that. Um, but if there is an opportunity for you to speak up and to be heard, I encourage you to step into that. Wonderful. Well, I truly appreciate you joining us today. This was an awesome session. Um, I really appreciate you kind of sharing your unique perspective as a registered um, dietitian, um, just because obviously that's something I, you know, didn't know about. So I today, along <laughs> with you, um, STEM sisters, I learned something new today. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us this week and. Um, as I kind of stated before, um, your information, we'll have it in the description bar. And, you know, we try to um, let the people that are on this show be, become a resource for the, you know, viewers watching. And so I'm sure that Tamla's open to, if anybody <laughs> wants to reach out to her, I'm sure she's open to that. And so yes. we'll leave some of her information down below. But thank you so much um, for joining us this week, guys. Have a good rest of the day.
Thank you. Bye.